Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I am so excited. Um, want to see some some of um, our old friends, our seasoned faculty who have been with us along the way uh, with the Education Abroad journey, but I'm also seeing a lot of names and, and participants from within our system. So welcome, truly a pleasure to have you join us on this Friday and spend some time with us. And hopefully this will result in seeing some of those digital badges uh, being awarded to you all and seeing them in either your signature line or your letterhead or any kind of communication. So. Thank you for, I will say, joining us on this journey today. Um, a little bit of some uh, travel of the mind will occur today and some new thoughts and ideas and hopefully some inspiration. So I am Magdalena Grzynski Hall. I am currently the Interim Executive Director of Global Carolina, and I am also the Director of the Education Abroad Office here on our main Columbia campus. I've been in the Education Abroad Office since August 2014, seems like forever ago. And I stepped into my interim role this past July. And um, in my interim role, I actually not only oversee education abroad programming, but really the internationalization um, program here for our university. So international student services falls under my purview, English programs for internationals, and our international accelerator uh, program as well. So in the last five years, if we're to talk about study abroad, we've seen tremendous success in regards to our education abroad faculty-led programming. We've seen an increase in programming by 23%, and so this led to the hire of a faculty support staff member responsible for our training materials, our implementing our best practices in the field, guiding all phases of faculty-led program development, and really adhering to the national conversation through the various organizations um, that we interact with. More recently, you will notice that U of SC's strategic plan now calls for an expected 5% increase each year in study abroad programming from now until 2025. And so in addition to study abroad specifically, the university is also looking for a 10% increase of the student body to graduate with GLD graduation with leadership distinction by 2025 as well. And this can be achieved through several pathways, but one of them that is near and dear to us is um, housed within the Education Abroad Office, and it is the global pathway. The strategic plan also calls for a 10% increase in experiential engagement through 2025, which is, again, supported by Education Abroad programming. Education Abroad is inherently an experiential um, opportunity for our students. Additionally, the university is looking to formalize and explore strategies and techniques to create virtual online experiential opportunities and introduce the maximum number of online experiential programs feasible until 2023. So with all of these goals in mind, we are excited to present an opportunity today that fits these objectives. Good morning, I'm Jenna Reese White and I am the Global Collaborations Manager for the Education Abroad Office. My role includes working with our faculty and staff leading courses abroad and to support and communicate with them to build successful programs. This role is responsible for training and advising faculty in all facets of leading a program abroad, including university policies, health and safety, marketing and recruitment, and budgeting. I've been supporting faculty programming since 2018, um, which seems both shortly ago and also very long ago, <laughs> facilitating workshops, building training modules, and generally preparing faculty to take students abroad. Recently, I created a Blackboard for all faculty and staff, which I'll be referencing throughout this workshop. Um, and that's for those of our faculty who have led, will lead, or are interested in leading abroad. And they can find all relevant forms, training, materials, important travel announcements, upcoming deadlines, and other pertinent information to Global Classroom. So our learning objectives for today's session are that you will be able to learn about the historical context of online international programming. Um, we want to go ahead and help you participate in a hands-on experience. Um, and you will also be able to be familiarized by the end of this session with the resources that are available to begin building a virtual education abroad experience. Uh, we know that we have a limited amount of time today, so um, we're not looking that you can achieve 
to start building a GLE at the end of this, but um, you should have more information so that you can start thinking about it. And then the following sessions will be there to support you in building a GLE and eventually leading one. Um, so in addition to today's session, there are two more required sessions in order to fulfill the mini series. Um, and like Casey said, there will be an e-badge then at the end of this series, and you can see that on our screen. Um, I think it's really cute and clever, so I was very pleased when I saw this come through. I know Magdalena was as well. Um, and you can place this e-badge in your email signature, um, or if you have a professional web page like LinkedIn or something along those lines, you can go ahead and display it there. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and start us off with experiential opportunity similar to what our students experienced during the pilot GLE, which we ran this past May, and we'll talk more about that soon. I'd like to welcome Elizabeth Koenig. She is the Hospitality Project Director of Banfi Winery from Montalcino, Italy. Elizabeth, go ahead and tell us a little bit about where you are right now and uh, maybe what time it is and what, you, what that bottle is next to you. Um, well, right now I am in the medieval castle of Poggio le Mura in the heart of our vineyard estate. It is 5, 10 p.m. in the afternoon, a rainy afternoon in usually sunny Tuscany. So I'm sitting indoors in the library room or the reading room, which is part of our hotel. Um, and the bottle next to me, I actually forgot to bring a bottle here. So this is a bottle on display on the mantel in the uh, back rack. It's uh, our Brunello di Montalcino, our classical Brunello. Banfi is a vineyard estate that produces classical uh, wines, such as Brunello di Montalcino, proprietary blends. But we're also an agricultural estate. We're a farm. The castle has actually been a farm since the Middle Ages. We produce, we grow wheat, we are the largest producers of dried plums, formerly known as prunes. Um, we, also, we have a, a very extensive hospitality operation, which this year, though, is operating on a different um, schedule, let's put it that way. The hotel um, is closed and uh, we're um, Closing one of the restaurants earlier this season, um, but we're working very hard to uh, relaunching next year in March. When we also hope to be able to relaunch our hospitality programs, our uh, scholastic tours, and the other activities we've had to put on hold. We're so excited to, to have you um, as a guest lecturer for the pilot that we had back in May. Um, and I know that we'll, we'll speak about this course a little bit, but the topic of this course is luxury management. So I was wondering if you could tell our participants today um, a little bit like what you told our students, um, how the Castello embodies luxury and, um, and what that looks like for you in Italy. Um, the Castello embodies luxury, uh, history is luxury, well, everything is luxury right now. But uh, history is luxury. Wine can be luxury. Uh, enjoying a meal with a glass of wine is luxury. So we've uh, dedicated ourselves to luxury uh, in many ways. Uh, Banfi, actually, the United States, the U.S. Foundation started a study abroad program, the so-called Scholastic Tour, um, in 1973. Actually, uh, six years six years, five years before they purchased their property in Italy. So we've been leading students on international study programs for a very long time. And we miss that. Um, uh, we did have a lot of fun. I did have a lot of fun in, in um, May during the lockdown uh, with our hospitality, with our luxury management session. But, um, I, also missed very. I missed Sandy Strick and the group very much this year. Um, the, it's one thing to uh, see um, see us on a video, but and see the surrounding landscapes. I remember I also walked around with my computer to show uh, the pad, the vistas. But um, I think it is a very important experience uh, to put your feet on the ground. I come from a 
global background. My parents are Swiss from Zurich. Um, I spent my childhood in the United States. We relocated to Switzerland and I've been in Italy since 1982. So I am here. I'm your global element today and I look forward to the learning experience. Yes. So we, Ban yeah, despite our remote location, we are about an hour and a half south of Florence and two hours north of Rome. Uh, we have become a truly global community. Uh, we see 60,000 visitors a year from many different nations, um, from the United States, from South America, from Europe. Now, we've been seeing more Italians, more Europeans, so we stay, um, you know, we stay in touch, but um, we look forward to um, to the to being able to share more of our hospitality with more guests. So after after the pilot um, course in May, oh, and there's Sandy. She says we miss you too. <laughs> um, after the pilot course in May, did you have any other opportunities to um, be a guest speaker virtually, or um, has the Castello taken on any virtual programming? We've taken on virtual programming on social media. My colleagues have, especially during the harvest, now in September um, and, and uh, at the beginning of October. I recorded a two and a half hour marathon session for a training course on wine tourism. Just me and my PowerPoint, that was probably the, um, the worst experience I had because I don't like I like listening to my own voice, as you can say, and I can go on, but uh, two and a half hours was a very long time. To talk and just in front of the a little bit more exciting to talk to students. But they had to, they had to, uh, the modules, the two, two and a half, three hour modules come from training courses to acquire credits. So, um, and the sessions were recorded so that uh, because online or um, direct teaching was not possible at the time, and most of the uh, participants were professionals, so they could also follow the courses at any at their own uh, at their with their own time frame. So we have done a lot. I mean, it has been yours was probably my first, and uh, after that, I uh, I also. Uh, Everyone started, and for everyone, it was a learning experience also. Because we are much, uh, with a glass of wine, which I didn't bring in my hand, we're much more hands-on um, than, um, than online. Yeah. But it has been, uh, it has really helped us um, reach out when uh, we can't reach out otherwise. Yeah. So it, has been a very experience. And, um, uh, it was just a small consolation for not seeing the uh, University of South Carolina group in a week later in May. Well, we it's been a long standing tradition. So we uh, it was it was really a lot of a lot of fun talking about luxury and what luxury means in these times because it's not the same. Well, we, we so appreciated that you were able to speak with the students and um, they remarked on just how much they benefited from this course and we'll talk about that a little bit later today. Um, but I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for you, Elizabeth. And um, if, if you have any comments that you'd like to make, um, we're, we're open to them, but otherwise we just wanted to thank you so much for joining us this morning. So you should all be seeing my screen now. Um, this is a virtual tour that was incorporated into the course that we are referring to. Um, so not only were students able to talk to Elizabeth and, and learn from her and ask questions live, um, but they were also able to have a look around the ground. So in these 3D virtual tours, you're able to walk through on your own time. You can take a look around. These are entirely 360. Um, with some of these, like this one, you, you do have the option to play. So they can take you 
on the tour in, in a certain amount of time. Um, the other thing that's, that's really cool about these um, is that you also have the ability to choose how you want to see this. So um, students who have VR goggles or if they even have the cardboard headset and they're using their phone to view this tour, um, they can actually put on the headset, they can choose um, this button right here. And that means that they will get a double image. And that double image allows them to be more immersed in this as well. Um, but Elizabeth uh, had originally talked to the students during the daytime, so they were able to see this in the background um, and look out over the hills and see the trees. Um, and the wind was blowing. It was a beautiful day. Um, but they also had the opportunity to walk around with a buddy virtually and remark on what was going on in a tour such as this. And this is not the only one, just one of the tours that they experienced. Um, but this morning, we wanted to be able to give you a hands-on version of what you may see in a GLE. So you heard from a live synchronous speaker who is on location, and then you're also able to see what the asynchronous material looks like in something like a virtual 3D pre-recorded tour. And Magdalena will give us a little bit of a history on how we got here. Great. So, a typical year for our Education Abroad office looks like the top of the slide. According to Open Doors, IIE, which stands for the Institute of International Education Data, we are ranked 19th in the nation for midterm study abroad. So sending over 800 students on a semester long exchange or academic year experience is common for us. According to last year's data, national data, we are 24 out of 25 top sending institutions in the country. This was our first appearance on the national list. We're also number 24 out of the top 40 Research One universities, which is up from number 36 all the way back in 2014. So we've seen tremendous growth and commitment to our education abroad mobility numbers. Additionally, we support faculty-led programming for fall break, winter break, spring break, Maymester and summer. So we have various touch points throughout the academic year. As such, when the coronavirus spread and multiplied across Europe and beyond, we knew that more and more students would be impacted by our suggestion for them to return home. Ultimately, we were faced with recalling over 800 University of South Carolina students home from this past spring semester or spring break programs. We also had our IPHE program on the ground in Sweden with our faculty and staff participating just as borders were, were closing. It was an intense time. Additionally, as our Student International Travel Oversight Committee, what you might see abbreviated throughout our communication as SITOC, we met. We were soon faced with canceled faculty-led programming for the upcoming Maymester and for the summer. And last year, what hurt so much is that we had received more proposals for faculty to lead abroad than ever before. And very few programs had been canceled due to low student enrollment. We were elated to send these groups out. But ultimately, because of the success, we were also faced with canceling 46 faculty-led programs, which impacted over 500 students this past year. At the same time, students we're planning to take a few courses over the summer, which students often do to stay on track with multiple majors or minors. We're also left without plans to fulfill that coursework. And so overall, the number of summer students alone was over 700. So I think we're on to slide six. Thank you. So in response to the forced move in spring, institutions and partner programs alike quickly shifted to online learning until the end of their terms. Students returned home, either to Columbia or somewhere else in the US, and they completed coursework and exams online. This was not ideal. It was, in fact, very stressful. But all students were able to successfully receive credit for their courses from abroad. We're currently processing their transcripts. Once spring semester ended, and it was clear that the impacts of COVID-19 were going to continue, 
these same partners and institutions began evaluating how to best serve students in international programming without the international traditional travel component. Summer is a popular time for students to study abroad in order to fulfill their internship requirements as well. So what we saw was an instant pivot by third party providers to virtual internships. These internships offered students the ability to work with an international office, a business, a nonprofit, and liaise with international professionals who would guide their projects from within their homes in the US. Third party providers used their existing partnerships in country to create their remote experiences for students. In the meantime, though, the Education Abroad Office was simultaneously instantly forced to delve into similar technological options with on-campus partners and otherwise to continue to support students who needed to complete their programs in spring and for the future students who were planning to soon depart. There was also a demand on our campus both from students and faculty to continue internationalized learning. However, we quickly learned that there is a varying level of comfort from our faculty in regards to online technology available to them not the least of which was dealing with the timing of our request. Faculty were already in the midst of rolling out many of their on-campus courses into online formats via Blackboard. And so we began to research how technology was used in the past to facilitate online international learning. And so at the onset of our research, we discovered the well-established SUNY Collaborative Online International Learning Model, or what you might see in the literature and presentations as COIL. After attending webinars and combing through the articles published about their various successes, we began modeling for U of SC. The COIL model pairs two courses at two different universities to complete a project or coursework together all virtually. Faculty and students from the US would video chat with a group of students and their instructor in Japan, for example, and the course's learning outcomes would be built together. Established in 2004, SUNY was able to grow their COIL program in terms of international partnerships, funding support, and training for faculty and staff. The American Council on Education, ACE, led their first ever collaborative academy with COIL in 2017. And they announced that COIL programs had expanded access to global learning at home. With the restraints on physical travel from the pandemic and a growing student need for internationalized coursework and internships, we decided this was the programming that our university would benefit from. In modeling for U of SC programming specifically, we narrowed in on COIL's model for what is known as hybrid virtual exchange. In this hybrid COIL model, a pre-existing course incorporates third-party or outside materials into the professor's lectures for a course with international components. We knew this model already. It's how our global classes programs work. A faculty member works with an international partnership in our global classrooms to teach an already established course with internationalized components. However, one of the apparent challenges here is that we would be converting our global classrooms, which we were very comfortable with, to virtual experiences. Within the Education Abroad Office, we assessed how we could support and guide the developmental conversation for virtual education abroad, both for our third-party providers and their courses and internships, and our own programming here at U of SC with faculty. We created our lists of requirements and the gaps in programming caused by restrictions on physical travel. Additionally, we knew that we would need to incorporate GLD, graduation with leadership distinction, and the global pathway requirements and experiential learning outcomes, so we were sensitive to the integrity of post virtual experiences. With that, we had to evaluate our policies and procedures of physical study abroad experience and how we could transfer that into a virtual platform so that students could complete their degrees and certifications without hindrance. As such, we took what we learned from COIL in our research and we created our Global Learning Experience Portfolio, or GLEs. These programs are faculty-led and focus on internationalizing the current academic syllabus to incorporate international cultural elements into the curricula. The difference between our GLEs and global classroom programs is in the delivery of these courses. GLEs are strictly virtual. 
each GLE will be folded into our typical review processes with a few differences. There will not need to be a review of the health and safety of the location traveled to, for instance. However, a review of academics through a thorough syllabus and departmental approval will still be required for each GLE proposal. Additionally, all logistics information requested for a global classroom, which is what you see on the screen here, will also be requested for GLEs, like course fees, program fees if applicable, um, if faculty are using a provider, what the course code is, and so on. This process and the requirements for our GLEs were proposed to and approved by Sandra Kelly, the Vice Provost and Dean of Undergraduate Studies, this past, sum this past summer. We expressed to her that it was important for us to continue our legacy of supporting meaningful global programming while upholding academic rigor. In order to properly incorporate experiential benchmarks, each GLE is required to have a minimum of 25 hours of real world experience for the Center of Integrative and Experiential Learning, or CL. This is quite small font, but I promise that there is a version of this available that is on Blackboard, and I'll show you how to gain access to Blackboard if you don't already. Uh, the hands-on experiences that we're referring to look a little bit different from our typical physical um, global classroom experiences, um, but we have a list of these requirements and examples so that you can build your course with those supports. There are some mandatory requirements that you'll see on the left-hand side, um, and these are some items such as the Global Competency Aptitude Assessment, and that's something that we administer through our office. Um, we have pre and post course sessions, which are led by the Education Abroad Office, and these mirror our physical orientation and re-entry. Uh, and these activities, all three of them, are mainly facilitated by our Education Abroad Office staff member. Um, and then the faculty member is there to support making sure students do complete these activities. Um, additionally, the Education Abroad Office is there to schedule synchronous orientation sessions um, and make sure that students have all of this information. Other required activities will be more faculty driven, um, which you'll see in, in partly on the right hand side. Um, that would include also some of our mandatory activities like reflection and the culminating project. So after incorporating these mandatory activities into a pre existing syllabus, faculty are encouraged to explore possible activities that best fit their course. For instance, some courses may want to incorporate language lessons through their GLE. Um, they may even be focusing on a specific language within their GLE, which then makes language lessons quite mandatory for them. Um, but others may not need language lessons or may not want them as much, and they may want to focus on guest speakers um, and business visits from on location. Um, and if you're really techy and you, or you have access to somebody who is, uh, you can even create virtual atmospheres on Second Life um, or engage for students to explore with avatars. Um, and that's really immersive for them. Each GLE proposal will also need to explicitly note reflection and feedback experiences throughout the course. Um, Blackboard discussion boards, journals, Padlet, which we'll play with today. Um, and many more tools are examples of how to encourage student reflection and provide a place for faculty um, and staff on the program to offer feedback. Finally, GLEs are required to have this culminating project that I spoke about before. Um, it could be a business proposal, a letter to local politicians, really anything that is a culminating product of both the course's academics and the international elements that were introduced in the course. The requirements and steps to lead abroad are outlined in our Global Classroom Resources Blackboard, which all current, and uh, all current and previous faculty have access to. All faculty and staff who are interested in leading a program abroad are encouraged to submit their email to our website or to myself. Ultimately, our GLEs and our goal for our GLEs are to accomplish internationalized um, curricula for faculty leading abroad while all keeping entirely online. So the pilot GLE occurred this past May semester. Faced with the cancellation of their much beloved global classroom due to travel restrictions from the pandemic, Sandy Strick and Karen Edwards from HRSM pivoted their course to the GLE platform. And I am so forever grateful for them to, to be willing to be the guinea pigs for this. Sandy and Karen invited guests that they would have visited in country to give guest lectures on luxury management. 
Additionally, because they were not bound by one location in Italy, Sandy and Karen were able to invite more guests and visit more sites virtually within Italy than just staying in Florence. They asked their students to take an asynchronous virtual tour of a luxury hotel and walk using Google Maps Street View from the airport to their hotel. They could virtually visit the Sistine Chapel and look up and text or talk with their buddy about their experience and what they were seeing. Jenna and one of our other advisors, Anuja Parikh, worked with Sandy and Karen to deliver the Global Competency Assessment to our students participating in this course. Build their synchronous Italian-specific orientation session, complete with a guest speaker who is current exchange student at U of SC from Italy, and facilitate all synchronous sessions with students. Additionally, Jenna and Anuja took on the role of program assistants to Sandy's and Karen's course, checking in with students through GroupMe to discuss upcoming assignments, synchronous sessions, and update students with relevant Italian facts each day, as well as troubleshooting any technological issues. So as we've mentioned, we do not expect faculty members to fill these GLEs alone. The roles are outlined above for each type of participant in this process. Faculty on the far left will be tasked with creating the academic syllabus, but they are encouraged to request support in addition in, or in adding GLE requirements for their education abroad staff. They will lead the course as faculty and that lecturing, grading, feedback, all will be the sole responsibility of the faculty member. Additionally, faculty will be responsible for officially proposing the GLE in our system and requesting approval from their department um, and from their college. However, when it comes to most other responsibilities, these can be shared and we encourage collaboration. Education abroad staff are responsible for facilitating the two mandatory synchronous sessions at the beginning and end of the course, as well as administering global competency aptitude assessments to students before and after the course as well. Depending on faculty needs, our staff can make connections with international partners for faculty, as well as find or create asynchronous material for the course. Additionally, while faculty will be the main point of recruitment for their course, our office can market the GLE to students through social media, our newsletter, and other outlets. Ultimately, we are serving as partners for faculty leaders throughout the entire process. International partners have the smallest role in GLEs because they would typically not interact with your students throughout the entire duration of the course. International partners may appear once to a few times during the course to give lectures, either synchronous or asynchronous tours, and so on. You will typically have more than one international partner, so while your course will have lots of global aspects, they may not all come from a singular partnership. The pilot example, Karen and Cindy had five different international partnerships to work with. You may also be using a third-party provider to incorporate all requirements and globalize your course. If this is the case, you will be able to plan your virtual itinerary with a singular touch point. That person will be responsible for coordinating your synchronous and asynchronous international material. Finally, on the far right, students have a role to play in the success of your GLE as well. The expectation for students is that they follow the Blackboard itinerary and assignments, completing asynchronous material with their assigned buddy, if they are so utilized in the course, and attending synchronous sessions. They should also prepare for synchronous sessions beforehand to maximize their experience with guest lectures, tour guides, and so on. Not indicated above is the collaboration with on-campus partners, which we'll touch on more in a bit. Kind of like this slide, but not really, because you know, you know who's on there right now. <laughs> so there's, these are just some of the universities that we're aware of who are participating in some form of virtual education abroad. There are many, many, many more. In fact, we are surrounded by our neighboring state school systems already, and they are mobilizing and rolling out new virtual programming as we speak. But to focus on Clemson, Clemson supports the International Virtual Exchange. Their website says, the rapid technological changes of recent years have required educators to rethink the intercultural competencies students will need to be successful in increasingly blended communities and workplaces. International virtual exchange is a valuable tool to increase student access to intercultural communication and 
promote their development as global digital citizens. Clemson is also in the midst of creating a virtual partnership database, much like what we've seen with OIL. Speaking of which, the State University of New York, SUNY system, has entire network campuses in New York that participate in COIL programming. Additionally, they have created training for faculty to join in COIL programming, COIL Academy, and COIL course orientation. You can find many universities incorporating third-party virtual options like Northeastern or creating programming similar to ours. The move to virtual international programming is advancing and it has great traction as we've experienced in our exploration when researching for this CTE certification program. So in addition to the successes that we have already experienced and the lessons that we have learned from our pilot and from the programming that other universities have created, we wanted to highlight a few immediate benefits of GLEs that we are seeing and even anticipating. While we offer as many scholarships as we can through our office, through colleges and various systems on our campus, and there are many national scholarships students can apply for, study abroad programming can still simply be too expensive for some students, barring them from receiving a global experience. GLEs can be as inexpensive as costing students no additional program fee, to a much smaller program fee since they will not need plane tickets, money for food or shopping, housing, international travel insurance, visas, and other expenses. Just to give you an idea for those who may not have experience leading a global um, classroom program here at USC, those additional expenses can range anywhere from about $1,800 to about $4,000. Additionally, because these courses are recognized by our university, these virtual courses as education abroad courses, students are, will be charged in-state tuition in participating um, in registering for the classes, regardless of their residency status. In addition to financial benefits, students who are bound by location can also now experience education abroad. Previously, students who are bound to Columbia because, for example, of family obligations like caring for a family member, work obligations, needing to hold a continuous job, or even university obligations like athletes who cannot leave Columbia due to their training schedules. These students can now participate in education abroad while continuing to uphold their obligations locally. It's also important to note that some students may never physically study abroad due to disabilities whether physical or mental, a student who wants to travel abroad physically may be limited to that location's accessibility. For instance, many European countries do not have an equivalent of the ADA, so ramps are not always available for those who may need them. For these students, then, it's important that they can have an education abroad experience without compromising location or coursework. And finally, with the growing popularity of our global classrooms, faculty are faced with turning students away due to course size restrictions and physically traveling. There simply may not be enough room to support a larger group. While this is not always the case, we do have some larger student groups that travel. We also know that there are students seeking out globalized experiences who are limited by group size. So in future coordination of GLEs, we envision supporting both a physical and virtual program simultaneously to accommodate these students. All of these student groups, we would always encourage them to physically study abroad when possible and provide means of support where available. However, we also realize that traditional physical study abroad does not reach all these groups equally, and we know that GLEs can provide more access and inclusivity for students who may have never considered study abroad before. We know that planning and building a GLE takes time. It does not happen overnight. And we want to make sure you know that you're not alone in building this experience. On campus, the Center for Teaching Excellence has standalone workshops and certification series that can help support your pedagogical knowledge in building the online aspects of your GLE. For instance, CTE is supporting this mini series. They also, have offer, um, they also offer the online teaching and learning certificate which is paired up with the Office of Distributed Learning and e-learning services to bring faculty the tools to teach online. 
You can find more certificates like these on their website. We would also recommend the Integrative and Experiential Learning Certificate, or GLEs. Distributed Learning offers faculty a toolbox for online teaching and technology in the classroom. They offer faculty support from experienced producers, media specialists, and logistics coordinators in their course production. But also look into your department. So your department also has various points of support in building your GLE. Your department or college most likely has an alumni outreach coordinator you can work with to find previous U of SC students working abroad who can speak to your course material and the field abroad. Your department or college may also have international agreements in the location that you're hoping to focus on in your GLE. These established partnerships can offer opportunities for guest lectures, live tours, and language practice for students. Of course, you'll have support from the Education Abroad Office, just like Sandy and Karen's course. Our dedicated staff will be there to support your GLE build as much or as little as you desire. From the planning stages to the course itself, our staff are here to find international partners, plan synchronous and asynchronous material, engage students, and continue to collaborate and creatively think with you as you build this experience. I mentioned before about our Blackboard, um, as well as um, a way to see what, what agreements are um, available to us at the university. Um, so this is a list of the resources that we have now, and each one can be really broken down into several pieces. Um, but I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what your resources are in building a GLE. So we recently conducted a lengthy university audit process for our risk management, um, our risk assessment for faculty-led programming. Um, before we existed in SharePoint, um, which I know was difficult for a lot of faculty members. And so from that, we created a Blackboard, um, and that's the organization that I've made reference to throughout this presentation. This Blackboard, which is called the Global Classroom Resources, um, is available to any of our U of SC faculty or staff member. Um, when you click on that link, um, which I will go ahead and put in the chat once again, um, it will ask for your email address. I just request that you use your U of SC email address because it can only add people who are in our network currently. Um, so if you have an at email, an at mailbox, at SC, um, that's the email that I'm looking for so that I can add you to this. And then you'll have access to it. Um, you can see on the left-hand side navigation um, in the top right-hand corner um, picture that we have a lot of different tabs for you to go through. There's an entire section on steps to lead abroad that's going to incorporate our physical global classrooms as well as our GLEs. We'll also have a list of our pre-approved providers. There's a tab that's dedicated to providers, and that's where we can find some of the partnerships that we currently have to answer the questions from before, as well as this map that is in the lower right-hand corner of the slide. Um, this is um, part of our new agreement system, and it can be found on Global Carolina's website. It's called the Data Map. And uh, when you click on any one of those little blue points, it'll tell you the partnership that is there. Um, and so you're able to zoom in. Um, you can see what types of agreements are available. But um, this is how you can access where in the world USC is going to. Um, we have forums. We have webinars. We have guides. All of that is on Blackboard. Um, I'm continuously looking for webinars that are with our partners. Um, or at other universities that you might benefit from. And so I'm trying to upload those as quickly as possible and um, get all that information in one place for you. Uh, we also recently held our faculty symposium and we presented at Oktoberfest, both of which we covered material about our GLEs. Those recordings as well are in our Blackboard and Oktoberfest we found for CTE. Um, you are also welcome to reach out at any time to your education abroad liaison. Maybe there's somebody you've worked with in our office already who you're comfortable with, so you can reach out to them with any questions. You can reach out to me as well. My email will be on the last slide today. Um, or to Magdalena um, to begin planning your GLE. We're here to answer truly any question you have about the process. We also want to take the time to remind you about these international agreements that we've been talking about. Um, these are invaluable partners to building a GLE. So your department or college may already have these partnerships, um, and you can reach out to your business office or to myself to discuss any of these international agreements that are already available to you. 
Um, for example, you can work with these partners to create a language exchange or a guest lecture opportunity. Uh, and what's great about these agreements and these um, partnerships that already exist is that they typically um, offer you free opportunities for your students, so it can help keep that program below. Um, and that partner will just typically ask for a commitment on your end as well. So if they present to your class, they may say, at some point in the future, I'd like for you or a colleague of yours to present to my class. Um, additionally, just like with the global quality programs, you have the opportunity to work with third-party logistics providers. Um, these companies can plan varying levels of your experiential learning outcomes. They can plan guest speakers and virtual tours, um, but they do come with a fee typically. Um, and that these fees are typically for like programming. Um, they can be made in group pricing, um, which can be passed on to a department or college if they can support it, or they can pass it on to the students for a small fee. Um, having said that, we would say it's best program fees um, low enough so that if students are receiving in-state tuition, um, and they typically receive out-of-state tuition, but any program fee that you have on top of the in-state tuition is still below that cap of what out-of-state tuition costs. Um, so they'd never be paying more than out-of-state tuition. That's just a suggestion on our end, though. Um, and like I said before, the Global Classroom Resources has a list of these pre-approved providers. Um, and I've indicated which ones support virtual programming. We're seeing more and more who do. Um, and so that'll be updated as well. But we already have some strong partnerships that are supporting um, virtual learning. So before we end the session and open it up for all of your questions, we wanted to go ahead and cover some of the frequently asked questions about DOEs that we've already received. So one, what types of courses or disciplines can be offered as GLEs? Um, just like our global classroom, Ultimately, any course can be offered as a GLE or a global classroom. However, we do appreciate that some courses are suited better to online work than others. And so really, this is going to be a conversation um, maybe with yourself as far as what you feel comfortable with um, and changing that course from a physical face-to-face -face course in the U.S. Um, to internationalizing it and offering it online um, and how that works for you. Um, the second question that I get a lot is what kind of technical skills do I need to lead a DLE? A lot of this sounds very techy, but ultimately, um, if you just go with mandatory activities and you're not super techy, you can use Blackboard and Blackboard Collaborate Ultra and hit all of the experiential benchmarks that you need. Um, it's not going to be as hands-on as working in um, a lot of different experiences for students, but that's okay. This is a great place to start. Um, and so we mentioned that CTE has a lot of certification series. They have a cult program now, and so they can really support you in learning how to maximize your experience with Blackboard and making it as hands-on as possible. Um, Blackboard Collaborate Ultra is great because you can offer a guest link. So Elizabeth signed on today by just logging in as a guest. Um, and then you as the moderator of your Blackboard Collaborate Ultra session can promote anybody. So you can have presenters, um, you can have language lessons where the guest comes in and uses the whiteboard feature on Blackboard Collaborate Ultra and um, can ask students to draw on the whiteboard and to participate. So you can still make it very hands-on just using Blackboard. Um, but if you are more techy and you want to try something new or um, if you know somebody who's more techy, um, then you can really make it super immersive and create um, like virtual cities and virtual streets and virtual cafes and things like Second Life and Engage. These are virtual platforms um, that have been used in the past for things like gaming or gamifying classrooms. Um, but you can also have the students experience this also as avatars, which is really exciting for them. So it's up to you. Um, how autonomous am I in student reality? So we've talked about a lot of requirements, and you do need to incorporate the mandatory activities into your syllabus. Um, but you're really otherwise going to plan the courses you and your department see fit. So GLEs will come to the OPAC, which is our Overseas Programs Advisory Committee. Um, and that's so that we can review things like the academic, the international components, EL requirements for experiential learning. Um, but otherwise, we want you to be creative in how you fulfill these requirements. We want you to choose those activities that best fit you. And then finally, the last um, frequently asked question that I get is, will I be limited by location and online accessibility? And this is something that we touched on in our Padlet. Um, there are definitely some countries, especially if you choose a more rural area in your, in your country, that may have limited online accessibility. So 
if you're working with a provider, they'll be able to tell you where the live actor, the live interactions may be a little bit more limited or spotty. Um, but we can also help you come in um, if we have that partnership and you can talk with, again, any agreement that you may have through your department. Those partnerships will also be able to tell you just what their capabilities are. Um, something to consider, though, is if you want to do something with a large time difference. Um, so let's say you have a partnership in Russia and your program um, is set there virtually. Um, it's a very large time difference, so you're going to want to make sure that you're catering both to your students and to your partnership. And so um, your partnership in Russia may be something like uh, record a tour ahead of time so that they can answer questions live, but students can still experience that location during the day. Um, and that's something that third-party providers are also supporting. 